The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the World Bank and IRAP Saving Lives in the Bloomberg Philanthropies Initiative for Road Safety Key Outcomes webinar. My name is Alessandra. I am the Training and Accreditation Coordinator at IRAP. I will be your moderator today. Next. And we have two presenters today, Greg Smith, the Managing Director of Strategic Projects at IRAP. Hi, Greg. Where are you talking from today? Hi, Ali. Hi, everyone. Uh, normally, I would be presenting from Manila in the Philippines, but I've just arrived in Sydney in Australia. Mm -hmm. So enjoy Australia, Sydney. And we have Alina Burlaco, uh, the Transport Specialist for Global Road Safety Facility, the World Bank. Hi, Alina. Where are you talking from? Hi, Ali. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm talking from Singapore. I'm actually here and preparing to leave tonight to Romania, where, where, I'm, where I'm originally from. Ah, good. Um, so our webinar today has between 60 and 70 minutes. All attendees are muted, but you are welcome to post your questions on our chat at any time during this presentation. Our presenters will stop to answer your question. You can see the tool, the chat on your control panel. So just write a question there and we will answer for you during the presentation. This session is being recorded and the video and the presentation files will be available for you. You receive an email tomorrow with the links and how to access these files. And now I will hand over to Greg. Thank you, Ali. It's actually Hello, Alina. So, um, I'll, I'll be starting with the overview of, um, of this webinar and what we're going to cover. And this is basically this webinar will be split in, in four key topics. First, we will provide you a brief overview on what is the Bloomberg Philanthropies Initiative for Global Road Safety, which we will refer to from here as Big RS. Secondly, we are IRAP, what are IRAP assessments and how were they used under this program? What are the key lessons learned and the success stories? The third part is on the data for road incident visualization, evaluation and reporting tool called also driver and how it is being used. And lastly, but also very important on the high economic impact that traffic crashes have on the society. In this webinar, we will really only have a chance to scratch the surface of all that was done during the Big RS program, but we will be very happy to have follow up discussions afterwards. Handing over to Greg now. So just to begin with, we want to talk a little about why we work on road safety at all. And on your screen, if it hasn't come up already, you're going to see a picture of um, Pariyada. This woman's name is Pariyada. Her friends and family call her Yok. Yok was hit by a speeding vehicle while she was crossing the road. Before the crash, she dreamt of being a veterinarian, of being a vet. But that dream, it's over for her now. In the crash, she suffered severe brain injury. It means that she can't really memorize things anymore. And she has trouble analyzing and learning new things. So it means her dream of becoming a vet has been taken away from her because of the crash. Yet York is considered to be fortunate because she survived the crash. Three people in York's community more recently weren't so fortunate that they've been killed. The, like, the really grim reality is that stories like these play out across the world, not just daily, but hour by hour, minute by minute. In fact, road crashes are the leading cause of death for young people worldwide. And most of the world's crashes happen in the developing countries, which have the, the largest numbers of deaths, but less than half of the world's vehicles. The fact is that these crashes are preventable. They're not just a part of life that we need to accept. We know what works to save lives. What is needed is the systematic application of often simple and proven approaches, but at mass scale. 
Stories like this and this philosophy about approaching safety is really at the heart of all our organizations who work in road safety and at the heart of the Big RS program. You can learn more about York's story by following the link on the screen there. Um, and our friends at Vital Strategies have, have put that video together. So the Bloomberg Philanthropies Initiative for Global Road Safety, or Big RS, is focused on helping to save lives through proven interventions that reduce road traffic fatalities. The initiative works with leading road safety organizations to implement road safety activities and coordinate with in-country governmental and non-governmental stakeholders. It is a multi-sectorial approach, meaning it includes efforts on infrastructure, policy, enforcement, road user behavior and vehicles, among others. The Global Road Safety Facility, which we will refer to here as the facility or the GRSF, is administered by the World Bank and is one of the big RS partners. IRAP was invited by the facility to help it implement its safety program and you can find out more about Big RS and the facility by following the links on the screen. Under the Big RS, 10 cities, which are Accra, Addis Ababa, Bandung, Bangkok, Bogota, Ho Chi Minh City, Fortaleza, Mumbai, Sao Paulo and Shanghai, and also five countries, which are China, India, Philippines, Tanzania, and Thailand, participated in the Big RS 2015-2019. Through this webinar, the World Bank GRSF and IRAP team would like to share with you key successes and lessons learned over the five years engagement. So to begin with, let's talk a little about IRAP. And here I'm going to give you a bit of an IRAP 101 introduction. So the process that IRAP is best known for is this producing the road safety star ratings. And this was used extensively in Big RS. We start with a survey of the roads, primarily to collect videos or images of the roads. But we also gather additional information like traffic flows, data on traffic speeds and pedestrian and bike flows. We then take those images and record the road attributes that we know influence risk. These include features like whether or not there's sidewalks, whether there's intersections and what type of intersections, how many traffic lanes are there and whether there's street lighting. In all, we collect about 50 different attributes every 100 meters along the road. From that database, we then create the star ratings. One star is the highest risk, while five stars is the lowest risk. And really importantly, we collect a, or create a separate star rating for vehicle occupants, motorcyclists, pedestrians, and bicyclists. So it's possible, and in fact, it's quite common to have a good star rating for vehicle occupants on a road, but a poor star rating for motorcyclists, pedestrians, or bus. The star ratings are based on what we call crash modification factors. The chart on the right, which will appear on your screen in a moment if it hasn't already, is just one example of the many attributes that we use in the model. It shows the risk that pedestrians face when they cross a road. It shows that as the number of lanes in each direction on a road increases, so if it goes from one lane to two lanes to three lanes in each direction, the risk for pedestrians trying to cross that road rapidly increases. That's because the pedestrians need to spend more time on the road pavement exposed to moving vehicles. So the research like this is what underpins all the star rating modeling, which we're going to be talking about in the, the first session of this webinar. You can find lots of information about how the methodology works and the process works in those two hyperlinks that are on the screen at the moment. So even before we get started with producing the actual star ratings, but after we've collected the survey and the coding data, the, the information that we've gathered gathers is incredibly powerful. For example, the map that's coming up on your screen at the moment is from Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. It's showing the motorcycle lane provision across the roads that we assessed. And in, in Ho Chi Minh City, about nine out of 10 vehicles that use the roads are motorcyclists. So overall in Ho Chi Minh City, we looked at about 300 kilometers of roads. 
you can see the different types of lanes that are employed across the network as well as you can see in the black color where there's where there's roads with no motorcycle lane no specific provision when we speak to the local universities about these roads they say that there's this clear relationship between the different categories of motorcycle lanes and the actual crash performance they tell us that the best performing design is the one in the top right hand side that's where motorcyclists are fully segregated from heavier and often faster moving traffic by a safety barrier. This sort of information is valuable for local planning, but it can also be used for benchmarking between cities. It can lead cities like Bangkok or Sao Paulo, where there also is large volumes of motorcycle use, to ask how do we compare to Ho Chi Minh City on motorcycle infrastructure? As an example of how the data can be used for benchmarking, in a few seconds, you will be seeing a slide which shows the roads assessed in each of the 10 Bigares cities and is colored by speed limit. You can see that the roads in Bangkok are almost all colored in purple, which is 80 kilometers per hour. Ho Chi Minh City also has quite a lot of 80 kilometers per hour um, arterial roads, whereas many cities have quite a bit of the green and blue which indicate 50 and 60 km per hour. Shanghai stands out for its lower speed limits, which are often 30 and 40 km per hour. And of and course, in addition, oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'll go ahead, Alina. Um, so in addition to, to using those road attribute data to do the the benchmarking, of course, we can also use the star ratings. So what you can see on your screen now is the pedestrian star ratings across the roads that we assessed in each of the 10 cities. And so the black color is one star, two is red, three is orange, four is yellow, and five star is green. You can see, for example, that many of the roads in Bangkok are in the one star category. And that really does reflect the chart that Alina was talking about just now about the speed limits, which tend to be very high in Bangkok. But it's also a combination of the infrastructure provision to compensate for those higher speeds and specifically things like sidewalks and pedestrian crossings. On the other hand, the star ratings for Shanghai in the bottom right hand corner are, are relatively good. You can see lots of yellow and orange color there, which means four and five stars. That owes in very large part to the fact that the speed limits are quite low in Shanghai and that they're well enforced. So after we do the star rating assessments where we collect the data about the roads, the next obvious question becomes, how do I improve the star ratings and reduce deaths on my roads? So here on the screen, what you can see is an example of a safer roads investment plan. It's basically a prioritized list of the safety countermeasures that can fit within a given budget as well as an estimate of the numbers of FSI, which is fatalities and serious injuries that could be prevented if those countermeasures were um, implemented. The plans are really powerful and they support this evidence-based approach to strategic planning across entire networks and across many years. And they can also help to drill down into quite a bit of detail about where the improvements could be made. So if we take, for example, the signalized crossing item, um, hopefully your screens will be refreshing in a moment to show that a map is going to pop up. So if we're able to click on the signalized crossing item, you can see examples of exact locations where that countermeasure has been suggested. It's very and very easy to also see what the actual road environment looks like at that location because we've collected the video imagery of the road. So on your screen, you're going to see in a moment, a picture of the actual road appear. What you're going to see is that this is a divided road. It's got a number of carriageways. On the carriageways on the left, you can see that there's signalized pedestrian crossings. That's where you get the green or red man to, to indicate when to cross. But on the right hand side, you've got a regular zebra crossing. So there's this kind of mismatch between the infrastructure. So in the modeling that we've done, we've picked up that it probably makes sense to have consistent application of the signalized crossing across that entire carriageway. So these plans are really at the strategic level. They still require review by planners and engineers to consider really what is feasible and what's not feasible. 
but they can and they really are used to help shape budgets and work plans for one year, five years or several years. They provide incredibly an incredibly valuable tool for planning and understanding what impact could be achieved if safety countermeasures are implemented across the network. And so just so you know, these, these images, these particular images are from Accra in Ghana. So overall, the method that Greg has just presented you has been applied in all 10 cities and five countries under the big RS in terms of baseline safety, in terms of baseline safety assessments on existing roads, we actually have the numbers from these five years and we completed approximately 2,700 carriageway kilometer a city level, whereas in the country programs, the total is around 12,600 carriageway kilometer. In terms of recommendations translated into design solutions or infrastructure build, about 1,500 carriageway kilometers were assessed in the cities and more than 5,000 at the country level. In case you are wondering why we are talking about carriageway kilometers and not just kilometers, it is because roads with more than one carriageway, that is basically two or more carriageways separated with a, with a physical um, a barrier or median, were assessed and coded separately with the IRAP tool. Considering the safer roads investment plans that were generated, it's estimated that if all the countermeasures identified are implemented, then almost 7,000 lives in the cities and more than 23,000 lives in the countries would be saved between 2020 and 2030. And thinking just about the designs that have already been prepared or where improvements have already been made to roads, about 1,200 lives in the cities and 5,800 lives in the countries will be saved. It is important to point out that these are just the numbers of deaths and if we also consider the impact on serious injuries, we expect the numbers to be more than 10 times higher. And this is a huge impact of, of this uh, big RS program. One of the reasons that we've seen up outcomes um, from IRAP assessments translating into designs and actual upgrades of roads is that they have been linked with actual projects financed mainly by the World Bank. In total, Big RS activities supported 24 World Bank finance loans or advisory services, which have a total, a total dollar value of almost 8 billion USD. You can find, find out more about these projects by searching on the World Bank website. Hello. And at this point, Ali, do we have any questions uh, from have, the audience that we could ask now? Yes, we have one comment from Stelius uh, about the speed limits. So he's saying, apart from the speed limits, I would like to mention that the actual operational speeds are crucial factors. Furthermore, enforcement of speed limits may vary from city to city. Yes, absolutely. That is a very important point, and it's one that we will mention in the in the following slide, Stelios. So, yeah, absolutely, good point. And uh, Israel also say with respect to the car uh, crash modification factors, the factors used on IRAP system might not create adequate picture depending on the country. I think that will affect the effectiveness of the countermeasures proposed and star rating itself. Is there any plan to develop or modify the factors depending on the country or city assessed? Yeah, good question, Israel. Um, absolutely, those factors can vary from country to country and the, the international model that we use uh, uses the, the best international research that we can gather. Um, you can see in some countries that are a little more advanced they are beginning to use their own crash modification factors uh, for doing this sort of work. That does require really, really good research about crash data and its relationship to um, road design. But absolutely, we encourage everyone in the cities and the countries to, to really work to develop um, a good understanding about how, how changes in road design really do affect um, the local crash patterns, because that's when you're really going to get um, powerful impact. But for the moment, the, the IRAP model uh, is available to everyone uh, who doesn't have that data uh, available yet. 
And how were the cities selected? Anu Arunaba is asking. Hi, Arunaba. The, the, the cities were selected through a competitive process, which was led by, by the donor, by the Bloomberg Philanthropies. So this process started, I think, in 2014, and they, they had, it was a long list of, of cities, and based on, on proposal and some specific proposals that were actually submitted by each city, the donor decided on which cities uh, and countries will receive support. Um, and then I am receiving here from other people asking how their country can join the program or participate in the program. Can you say in general if there is, if it's open for other countries? Um, in general, I mean it's a it's a wonderful program. I I would also love to to work in each of the countries out there and to be able to support everyone. But um, Bloomberg Philanthropies, they are the ones doing the analysis and deciding uh, towards which countries they will redirect their support. And it's mainly on on um, uh, low income countries with a register recording a, a high crash rate. So the decision stands with the donor. And uh, we, as partner, World Bank, GRSF, uh, and also working with IREP, we basically follow recommendations from, from the donor from this specific program. Of course, there are other programs where um, both World Bank, GRSF, and also IREP, we are, we are engaged. But for the Bloomberg Philanthropies, basically, it's the donor who is, uh, who is making the, the case and who is uh, directing us when where we should work. Um, and then there are a few questions about the, uh, the methodology of IRAP. Um, how do you recognize elements on the road manually or using machine version? Yeah, Ali, I think before we go into the technical questions for now, uh, what I really encourage is people can take a look at some of the other webinars that are on the IRAP website, uh, particularly the one called the Star Rating Essentials. Uh, if you take that webinar course, you're going to learn a lot about how to practically do IRAP star rating projects yourself. Um, but of course, we are also going to post this presentation and the video on uh, the Schoology website, which Ali is going to explain to you at the end of the webinar. Uh, there'll be an open forum in there where you can post questions and we'll be able to jump in and, and answer for everyone. Um, so those sorts of questions, very happy to discuss with you. but. Um, perhaps we'll do it after the webinar. Yeah, I think we we have lots of questions coming. I think we can move on and we'll stop again to answer more questions. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Ali. And it's great to see such a, such an engaged audience. Okay, let us share some, some case studies with you now, beginning with speed management and then moving toward road designs and upgrades. We're only really going to scratch the surface of all the amazing work that's been done so far, but it will give you a sense of what has been achieved. I want to reinforce at this point that all of, the, all, all of these outcomes really are the result of teamwork among the biggest partners and also local partners in the cities and countries. Thanks, Alina. So yeah, let's begin with Bogota in Colombia. Um, so we're going to talk a little about how they've managed speeds on some of their key roads. In total, we had the opportunity to assess about 200 kilometers of roads with our friends in Bogota. Using that data, we could then help the city perform a series of what we call scenario tests to see what the impact would be of changing speeds on safety. So what the maps on the screen that you can see now show are results of some of that testing for just two of the roads. In the maps on the left, you can see what this, the star ratings, and this is star ratings for motorcyclists, what the star ratings are at nighttime. So this is the nighttime operational speed. And I should say these roads at this time had speed limits of 60. But what we found was when there was no congestion at nighttime, traffic can flow a little more freely and very often people would exceed the speed limits. And so in that situation, you can see the road is often one or two stars. In the middle, you can see what the star ratings are based on the official speed limit of 60 kilometers an hour. Uh, and, but it was sort of conversely to the nighttime situation during the day, the traffic was actually traveling slower than the 60 kilometers an hour because of congestion. But in this case, you can see the percentage of road rated three stars is a little higher 
than the nighttime situation. You can then see on the right how the star ratings improve when the speed limit or if the speed limit is reduced to 50 kilometers an hour. And like Stelios said a little earlier, here we assume that the 50 kilometers an hour is employed and there's good enforcement. So the, the actual speed that people are driving along the road matches at most the speed limit. So this kind of testing, it really helped us to build evidence with the city about how a reduction in speed limits could be positive. Then in October 2018, the city actually did reduce speed limits from 60 down to 50 on five major corridors. Now these five major corridors, they accounted for one quarter of the city's deaths. So they're incredibly important in terms of road safety. The speed limit reductions were also accompanied by really, really active police enforcement. In fact, the city installed around 50 speed cameras to help, it, help with the enforcement. And the effect was dramatic. According to their early reporting, quarter by quarter, the numbers of deaths, deaths dropped by 34%. That was 13 fewer deaths in that quarter compared to the same quarter in previous years. Most of those lives saved were motorcyclists. In the star rating maps, you can see where roads have changed, where they've changed from one and two stars up to three stars and sometimes four stars. These are mostly where the speed limit reductions took place. But the maps all show, show where roads haven't changed, the star ratings haven't changed. And clearly their opportunities, uh, that's where opportunities lie for further improvements. I should also add here that Bogota didn't just do speed limits as part of their work. They've also done some really great work on bicycle lanes and bicycle paths, and for example, pedestrian crossings at schools. The city of Fortaleza in Brazil is another one of the cities that really had a positive experience with managing speeds. And in fact, as you'll come to see, management of speed has actually been one of the most powerful messages to come from the big RS work over the years. Nearly 150 kilometers of roads were assessed in Fortaleza. Two of the roads where sections had speed limits reduced, also like Bogota from 60 down to 50, were Osorio de, pa de Pavia and Avenida Presidente Castela Blanco. But changing the signs wasn't all that the city did. There was also a speed awareness campaign conducted and other changes to the network were made, including bicycle lanes and improved signs and mark marking. The likely effect of the speed changes were again tested using the star ratings and an outcome is illustrated on the chart on the right. So those two charts show before and after for a section of the road. In the chart on the left, you can see lots of red and black color one and two stars on the chart on the right. No one star, a little bit still of the two star left for pedestrians, which is that third column, but a really large improvement in the risk or reduction in the risk for the bicyclists, which is that last column. So you can see a big green bar right there. The crash data reported by the city, which is really like the ultimate measure for safety, shows that serious crashes are down by about a third where these changes were put in place. So sticking with Latin America, one of the other cities in Brazil was in Sao Paulo. About 230 kilometers of roads have been assessed there. And that includes local streets, bus rapid transit corridors and major ring roads. And as in Bogota and Fortaleza, there's been this interesting work done on speed management. It's been an area of major debate and discussion. As just one example is uh, the Minanel inner, inner ring roads. So that photo on the left is an example of one of those uh, section of that ring road. This is a road that has three carriageways in each direction. It has the express carriageway, the central carriageway and the local traffic carriageways. In 2015, the speed limits were reduced on each of the carriageways like is shown in the photo on the left. So 70, 60 and 50. These were the new speed limits that were put in place. That year, the number of deaths was 45 compared to 60, 68 in the previous year. And in 2016, they went even lower down to 25 in one year. So a nice correlation between an adjustment in the speeds and reductions in deaths. Then there was calls to put the speed, the speed limits back to what they were previously. So 90 kilometers an hour, 70 kilometers an hour and 60 kilometers an hour for the three types of carriageways. In that year, we worked with the big RS partners to try and resist that move. B 
because we knew it would have a negative impact on safety. We produced the star ratings to help illustrate the impact on risk with changes in speeds. And that's what you can see on the right hand side. That photo is an example of one of the sections of the roads. And then the image down below is the star ratings for vehicle occupants and motorcyclists who are the major road users on this corridor, what the star ratings would be under different speed limit scenarios. And you can see as the star ratings go down, uh, sorry, as the speeds go down, the star ratings get better. Unfortunately, we weren't successful and the speed limits went back up in 2017 and the numbers of deaths were higher that year than in the previous year. So this is just one example where perhaps we haven't had the huge success that we hoped for, uh, but it definitely has been, uh, like in many places, an area where we've learned a lot and we've had a better understanding of the importance of using data and communication and strong leadership in a city. So that brings and us now to Thailand. Yep, moving to Asia now. Uh, Thailand, thank you, Greg. Uh, I've been working in Thailand in the last uh, three years. And in Thailand also, there have been some calls to increase speed limits on, on major roads. This is partially driven by concerns about the congestion that often chokes the city and the perception that lifting speeds can reduce congestion. To help inform debate about appropriate speed limits in the city, we made use of the star rating data that had already been collected across the city to demonstrate the impact that changes in speed would have on safety. The results shown on the screen on your right are for the outer ring road, which is a major arterial road that currently has a speed limit of 90 km per hour. At the moment, 70% of the road is rated three stars or better for vehicle occupants, but it experiences around 121 deaths and serious injuries each year. Our analysis shows that if the speed limit went down to 80 km per hour, and of course there was matching police enforcement, the number of deaths and serious injuries would drop to 85. And basically that's a 30% reduction. But if the speed limit is lifted to 120 km per hour, as some people have called for, the number of deaths and serious injuries would jump to 287 per year, a more than doubling of the level of trauma. We also looked at more local streets, like the one in the photo on your left, which passes next to a school, and where, as you can recall from our earlier benchmarking, the speed limit is actually set for 80 km per hour. The analysis shows that on, on, on local streets, a decrease in speed limit from 80 to 50 kilometers per hour combined with good enforcement, but without any other safety treatments, would result in 77% decrease in fatalities and serious injuries. Basically, saving eight lives out of 11 being killed or severely injured every year on this 2.5, 2.3 kilometer stretch of road. On the screen, you can also see in, in green the link for a report, uh, for the report with the results, detailed results of the speed variation study from World Bank GRSF and IRAP, IRAP in Thailand. And Greg, for you, back to, to talk a bit on, on Philippines. Yeah, thanks, Elena. In one of the many assessment projects that we did in the Philippines, we looked at a really major corridor that connects three major cities in the southern province of Mindanao. You might have heard of Mindanao in the news recently where there's been a pretty major earthquake. This corridor, it's about 300 kilometers in length and based on the reported data and estimates, about four people are killed each week on this corridor. And although the motorcyclists represent just a quarter of the traffic on the corridor, they account for three quarters of deaths. So based on that, as you might expect, the road was mostly rated one and two star. And you can see a photo, a typical example of the road on the left. A key question that was asked of us by the World Bank and the Department of Public Works and Highways was how do we lift this road to at least three stars? So to help answer that, we performed these series of scenario tests, which really il illustrated the relationship between investment in infrastructure and balancing speeds. And that plays out in the chart on the right-hand side. It's a little complex, so I'll talk you through it. Each of the colored bars represents a road user. So vehicle occupants, motorcyclists, pedestrians, and bicyclists. 
and on the vertical you can see the percentage of road that would be rated three stars or better so the baseline situation you can see most of the road less than 20 percent in most cases is rated three stars or better if we invested php which is philippine peso 1.9 billion you can see there would be some impact a little if you really extended that to 7.2 you would make a big impact in the percentage rated three stars or better but the best impacts actually come with slightly less investment 6.6 .6 billion or down to 6.4 but combining that with reduced speeds so the optimal investment scenario that we identified was actually ensure that traffic doesn't exceed 70 kilometers an hour in the rural areas and 40 kilometers an hour in the villages towns and cities essentially where there's lots of pedestrians trying to use the road and uh, other vulnerable road users like motorcyclists so that combination of investment and adjusting speeds of course with strong police enforcement is the optimal arrangement and under that arrangement we estimated that over 20 years, you could prevent 20,000 deaths and serious injuries. So Ali, we have a chance now to take a few more questions um, if they're, they're stacking up there. Yes, we have a few. Um, so Mohamed is saying that in low income countries, low and middle income countries, most of the fatalities and injuries concern to pedestrian in, in, in rural areas. Uh, did we focus that on, on these projects or how to focus on these issues? Yeah, absolutely. It was a, a very big focus. And one of the key things that you see when you do the benchmarking between the cities or the data sets that we did at the countries is just how much of these roads don't have accessible sidewalks. And in many cases, there is actually some sort of sidewalk built but it's it's not accessible. It's used by motorcycles or it uh, has street sellers or uh, has poles in it. So absolutely, like a focus on how to ensure that pedestrians can use the roads safely was a really, really big focus. Uh, but also in, in uh, particularly in Asia, how motorcyclists can, can use the roads safely. Uh, in many cases, they account for the large majority of people who are dying on the roads. And so in each case, we needed to be a little flexible about the optimal arrangement, optimal uh, response. But most certainly designing roads to ensure that vulnerable road users uh, and not put at risk is, is a big priority for us. Um, so, and then there, is, there are a few questions about the speed limit in the sense of uh, how do you stipulate the speed that is credible? and how to make, how to ensure that the speed is being respected. Ali, Alina, would you like to jump in on this one? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, enforcement is one of the key things, but I also, from, from my perspective, I think it's very important uh, to, to design and to create self-explaining roads, especially when we're talking about um, rural roads where people tend to have a higher speed but then from the, then the, the 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 driver goes through a built up uh built up uh, area where houses are on the right of the and the left of the road so in order to reduce the speeds not just by putting a road sign we will need some infrastructure measures in addition to the to the uh, reduction in, in speed limit and this can be translated into um, lane narrowing or adding median barriers to reduce the lane width or maybe chicanes so there are a few a few measures engineering measures that can definitely be be, be implemented in order to make sure that drivers will use a reduced speed also, one of the measures can be uh, race pedestrian crossing, which allows pedestrians to cross the street in a safe manner and will also um, basically make drivers to reduce their speeds instead of just adding a zebra crossing, which, as I've seen in, in, in some places in, here in the region in Asia, uh, not necessarily are respected just to have a, a marking and a zebra. If yeah, you want to add... Yeah, you can also find really good like generalized information, for example, from the World Health Organization. Uh, if you Google WHO road safety uh, and speeds, you're probably going to find um, some sort of uh, information about 
what is kind of like the tolerable speed for different road user um, types and, and different cases. So for example, if you have pedestrians sharing space with vehicles, uh, without some special infrastructure, you, you really can't have vehicles going much faster than 30, maybe 40 kilometers an hour before it starts becoming a problem. Um, on undivided roads, once you have cars at, uh, having a chance of having head-on crashes at more than 70 kilometers an hour, you're going to start having some serious um, challenges. So there's some rules of thumb um, that you can definitely use, but also really encourage you to get in touch with some of the cities that we've already talked about, uh, particularly Bogota and Fortaleza, and share, share your experience and see if you can share their experience about how they've gone about reducing speeds and um, like the, as part of the technical process of lowering the speeds, what is an appropriate speed? How do they encourage the enforcement? But also how do they win the community um, and to get the community on their side, to help the community understand why it's important um, that lower speed limits um, are put in place to help, because it's to help save lives. One of the big challenges we've, we've had in many of the cities is the perception that lowering speed limits or traffic calming is gonna just create more congestion. Um, which almost is certainly not true, um, but it does take careful design and careful implementation. So definitely there's lots of information that we can share after the webinar, um, but perhaps there's some chances we can, we can connect you with some of the cities who've had good experiences as well. Okay, I think we can move on and we'll stop again for, to answer more questions later. Great, thanks Ali. Okay, so now let's take a look at some of the case studies where we assessed designs and actually upgraded where we assessed roads that were actually upgraded. Um, and at this point, I really want to say uh, we at the IRAP and uh, the, the World Bank team, we didn't do the designs that we're going to talk about ourselves. Um, rather, we made suggestions and, and prepared star ratings for designs that were prepared by others. And in many cases, these were the big RS partners such as WRI or NACTO GDPI or local design institutes. Um, in Bangkok, one of, one of the cities that I've been working a lot in the past uh, three years, um, more than 400 kilometers of roads have been star rated. One of the design examples in, uh, is where Bigger's partner, WRI, created concept designs for three priority roads. And these are Silom Road, Asok Monti Road, and the Aurat Road. The concept designs, a sample of which is shown in the top right image, are focused on reducing risk for pedestrians and included pedestrian crossings, pedestrian fences, median islands, and changes, uh, changes to the side of intersections. Basically also what I was mentioning a bit earlier uh, on how we can adjust the speed. These types of safety countermeasures had also been identified earlier in the IRAP assessments. We then conducted a star rating assessment of the design, and the results showed that the proposed solutions would lead to large increases in percentage of road sections rated three stars or better. And at the same time, it was estimated that 180 fatalities and serious injuries would be prevented over 20 years period. And this is basically a reduction of about 20 to 30%. Showing these metrics and the improvement in star ratings and potential life saved helped staff in the Bangkok Metropolitan Administration to make the case for implementation of the designs, a part of which is shown in the photo. Thanks, Alina. Okay, and turning to another city in Mumbai, uh, in India, where we assessed more than 200 kilometers of roads. One of the roads where there was a lot of focus um, by all the partners and the city is called LBS Marg. This is about 10 kilometers long, and it's a major arterial road in the eastern suburbs. Incredibly, around 13 people were being killed on this road each year. The far majority of those killed are pedestrians, motorcyclists, and people in auto rickshaws. The IRAP assessments showed that, for example, very little of the road had formal sidewalks or effective pedestrian crossings, despite the fact that pedestrian flows were really high. In some places, the number of people crossing the road was more than a thousand per hour in the peak periods. So we made a series of suggestions for the road and the big RS partner WRI prevent, uh, present, sorry, prepared designs. 
Um, and following a series of iterations and consultations with the city and the partners, they came up with a plan that really fits the local context. And like the, that's like the sketch that's shown on the center of the screen there. It includes these wide sidewalks, pedestrian crossings with traffic coming speed humps uh, just before them, adjustments to car parking and bus stops, adjustments to intersections to especially make better use of this kind of dead space in these very large intersections, and including pedestrian signals and refine at traffic lights, and also this refinement of traffic lanes to make sure that they were uniform along the whole road. There was a really strong case made also that by better allocating space to each road user, especially allowing pedestrians to walk, actually walk on sidewalks rather than on the road itself, that not only be this safety improvement, but also improvement in traffic flow. And this touches on the, the point and the relationship between smooth, uncongested flow and um, I guess safe space for all the road users um, in the road environment. So overall, the road designs, which are now starting to be built, will see pedestrian star ratings dramatically improve. And you can see some examples there where we're looking at five and four star ratings for all the road users. Um, most importantly, we made an estimate that the designs will save more than 70 deaths and serious injuries every year. That'd be about a halving of the current trauma rate on the roads. That's if all the, all the safety countermeasures that are included in the designs are implemented. And on the right hand side, you can see one of the locations already where the sidewalks have been improved. Now, sticking also with India, um, to help the star ratings of national highways and state highways in the, at the country level improve, um, safe demonstration corridors have just become this really regular feature of World Bank finance projects. Uh, in fact, if you search online, if you Google online World Bank Road Safety Blog, so World Bank Road Safety Blog, perhaps if you throw in India there, you're going to find some great examples from the bank about the work that they've been doing. For each one of these corridors, a target of achieving at least three stars was set. And in addition to performing the IRAP assessments and building engineering safety countermeasures, some of the demonstration corridors have also had this enhanced police enforcement and efforts to improve post-crash medical response. So there's been this focus on not just doing infrastructure improvements, but I guess a more comprehensive approach to making the corridor safe. One really excellent example is shown here on the screen. It's part of the SH-20 <laughs> corridor in Karnataka. It's about 56 kilometers long. Before the improvements were, were made, mostly the road was weighted one and two stars. It had an average of 50 deaths and almost 300 injuries each year on the stretch. Since the demonstration corridor project was implemented and all the improvements made, the road's mostly rated three stars or better now and deaths and injuries have pretty much halved. The deaths are down 54%, injuries are down 42%. And interestingly, these actual numbers are really, really similar to the forecast that was made earlier in the IRAP assessments. And the kind of treatments that have been put in place, they're not that complex. They're often simple, often very cost effective, but they're known to be, known to, be um, uh, to work very well in other places. So they include things like traffic calming, raised pedestrian crossings, intersection adjustments like the one shown on your screen, and sidewalks. And now if we turn to China, at the national level, at the country level, there was a very large program of activity that happened. In fact, the big RS projects were linked to about nine World Bank financed projects, spanning from mega cities like Tianjin through to rural roads in the mountains of Gansu. So focusing on just one of these projects, these images on the screen that you can see now are from the incredibly interesting Tianjin Urban Transport Project. Again, if you go to the World Bank website and search for Tianjin Urban Transport Project, you can find details there. In this project, we worked with local teams to assess about 100 kilometers of city streets, especially those around transport hubs and uh, tourist destinations. And they were particularly interested in locations around the metro stations. After we completed the assessments, the city and the World Bank agreed to aim to ensure that roads achieve at least a four star rating for all road users. So it was very ambitious. We provided suggestions to the local design institutes about how to lift the star ratings of their designs. 
and help them keep track of how their designs were, were performing in terms of the star ratings. And you can see in the image on the, of the road before the improvements on the left, that beforehand cars were really like the dominant user of the roads. You can see that they were using the pavement, they were driving on the sidewalk, they were parking on the sidewalk. So pedestrians basically had to find their own way. Now the road has been totally transformed. The space for pedestrians has been dramatically increased with the sidewalks. You can see that the bollards have been put in place to protect the sidewalks from vehicles. So the cars can't drive on that area now and can't park there either. And the pavement surface has totally changed. It's kind of like this cobblestone effect to give it this traffic calming um, feeling. So the street looks and feels fundamentally different than it did before, and it's good for safety. So at other locations around this city in Tianjin, these sorts of treatments as part of this project are also being applied, as well as some facilities, some very clear bicycle and e-bicycle facilities. It's helping Tianjin to really grow into like a five-star city for active transport. Indeed, Greg, and it's very nice to see also the impact that we have through the World Bank project. And I also like to see that the that the bank has a great emphasis on road safety uh, finance, on road safety projects, basically, and then any transport project having a strong road safety component. Um, sticking with China, but in the cities, part of Big RS, we also had the opportunity to work with Shanghai. And one thing that you noticed when you visit Shanghai is the very high flows of bicycles and electric bicycles. Our assessments also really help to show that the infrastructure has been very much adapted to meet the needs of bikes and e-bikes with almost two thirds of the roads having some type of special bike lane in place which separate bikes from faster moving traffic. And you might remember from our slide much earlier comparing speed limits between the cities that speed limits in Shanghai are the lowest we saw among the 10 cities. There are absolutely more improvements that can be made, but it's already impressive work. One outstanding result in particular is the location shown on the screen where the WRI team and local partners work to adjust space to prioritize bikes and the e-bikes, as well as improve the sidewalks for students and teachers walking to and from the nearby university. In fact, this is the first project worldwide where we had the opportunity to award an official five-star certification for the improvement. And all these improvements basically were done from the budget of the Transport uh, Commission of Yangpu District in Shanghai. Another city that I would like to show you is, uh, and talk about is Ho Chi Minh City, um, where we've been working a lot to help improve safety for school children. And we've provided training to a local organization the Asian Injury Prevention Foundation in the use of the star rating for schools app. This, they then star rated 207 critical locations at 37 schools that were selected by the government and which are near to a proposed bus rapid transit corridor, which is supposed to be financed by the World Bank. Afterwards, locations at four schools were quickly selected for improvements, including sidewalks, yellow warning lights, refugee islands, school zone markings, pedestrian crossing signs, and slow down markings. These improvements led to an increase in the star ratings at all four schools, which indicates that safety for children, that the safety for children on their way, on their way to school has, has improved um, a lot. This year, the improvements are expanding to another 17 of the 37 schools, and it's likely improvements will be made to all 37 schools by next year. Apart from the star ratings for schools assessments in Ho Chi Minh, uh, the capacity that was built within the local organizations has enabled school star ratings to be expanded to support further improvements in other parts of Vietnam as well, and also through our uh, recently started coordination and, and collaboration with the University of Transport and Communication. Another city in Asia, since my focus was mainly in Asia in, in these past years, is uh, Bandung where about 170 carriageway kilometers of roads have been assessed. Uh, a series of designs focusing on pedestrian sidewalks have been prepared and in some cases already implemented. Note that this map that you can see on the screen uh, shows the pedestrian star ratings before improvements have been made. 
The designs have been prepared with our support by local institutes like the Institute of Technology Bandung and the Institute of Road Engineering and also by the big RS partner WRI. For example, the designs at Chugung Elementary School, one of the images on the right, would see star ratings for pedestrians improving from three stars to five stars. The design reduces the number of traffic lanes, expands the sidewalk, and adds a pedestrian crossing and traffic calming measures. In numerous locations, new or improved sidewalks and pedestrian crossings have already been implemented, leading to three and four star pedestrian ratings. These are a series of small steps, and of course, many more are needed in order to lift the entire map to three stars or better. But overall, we think that this is a very positive progress. Okay, let's jump across now to Africa and beginning with Tanzania. In Tanzania, almost 4,000 kilometers of roads have been assessed uh, and about 2,600 kilometers of designs. Many of those are national highways in the regional areas, but some, uh, quite a few in fact, are in the capital, like as shown here on the screen. So the images that you can see are for one of the projects called the bus rap uh, for a bus rapid transit system, which is part of the World Bank finance project. Uh, called the Dar es Salaam Urban Transport Improvement Project. The majority of the roads assessed are in this dense urban environment, but they also include a number of high-speed multi-lane roads, such as the one connecting to the airport. The image below the photo there is a typical cross-section of the design, and you can see where the buses um, are to run on the inside lanes with vehicles on the outside, and then an example of where the pedestrian sidewalks are allotted um, or a plan for improvement. In the top right hand chart, which is the star ratings for each of the road users for the existing road, you can see a fairly large percentage rated one or two stars, especially for the pedestrians and bicyclists. But if you look at the chart on the right hand side, through the designs, you can see that that percentage is, in, is decreasing quite a lot. Um, that's because the designs include things like really some important intersection improvements, improvements to the pavement that's going to increase the skid resistance, installation of a median that's going to separate out traffic flows where it doesn't currently have that, significant pedestrian facilities including accessible sidewalks and signalised crossings at key intersections. But you can see that there's still this fairly significant section of two star on the pedestrians in the designs. So we've made suggestions about how risk at those locations could be further reduced and that's especially important for the pedestrians, given that the bus rapid transit system is going to introduce a lot of new pedestrian activity onto the corridor, especially for those people crossing um, the main corridors into the BRT stations. In Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, I think our largest sample of roads was taken over the years. More than 500 kilometres of roads were assessed with our local partners in a series of phases over the five years. Since then, the partners have been working to gradually improve the network. That's included efforts through a World Bank finance loan, but also efforts by the local partners, the local city, uh, and for example, um, the team at NACTO GDCI have focused heavily on demonstrating key improvements that can be made to key intersections. For example, new sidewalks have been built around the city, pavement line marking has been improved, Pedestrian fences that guide people to safer crossing points have been installed. Bollards that protect sidewalks from vehicles driving and parking on them have been installed. And a lot of street lighting, almost a, I think about 20 kilometres of street lighting has been installed. And there's been this measurable impact on the star ratings across that huge 500 kilometre sample. So before the assessments, I mean, sorry, before the improvements were made, about 36% of that 500 kilometers was rated three stars or better for pedestrians, but it's increased by 12, so it's up to 48 by now. So nearly half of the roads are up to three stars or better. And even those modest improvements that we've talked about are gonna have a measurable impact in terms of people's lives. We estimate about 300 deaths and serious injuries in the next decade are going to be prevented because of the work that's already been done. And of course, there's more that can be done, but it is really a positive start and it sets a, a momentum that we hope for the coming years that can see the percentage of road rated three stars or better gradually, gradually, gradually get closer to that 100% mark. 
and still in Africa, in Accra, in Ghana, we assessed a series of roads right across the city. And one of the key ones that we assessed very early on was the N1 highway, which really splits the city um, from east to west. You can see on the map down the bottom there that that's the one with lots of one star section in there. Very early on, we realized by talking to the city that the most dangerous location was the La Paz intersection. And so there's been very heavy focus by all partners on trying to improve risk at that place. So in the top right hand corner, you can see the photo of the road before any works were done. There was 10 lanes in each direction, including the service lanes. The intersection, it was generally pretty poor quality and had this very, very large open space um, without any channelization, which guides the vehicles through the intersection. No pedestrian signal crossings, high turn speeds for vehicles turning right or turning left. Um, particularly for those turning right um, and limited lighting. So designs have been put in place by the city with inputs by all the, all the partners. And what's already happening is that the time period that pedestrians are allowed to cross at the signals has already been increased. There's a narrowing of lanes planned to try and calm the traffic. More median space is planned so that pedestrians crossing the road have more, more sp safe space to stand at when they're in the middle of the road curb ramps to make it accessible for everyone and better pavement markings. And you can see the star rating impact of the before and after series. It is possible to get this intersection up to four stars. And Ali, do we have any final questions or questions before we go into the last section? Yes, we have um, one question from uh, Sabame. Uh, if it took five years, to deliver all these uh, upgrades, it might be possible that when recommendations were made, the scenario would have been different than five years back. Was there any adjustments, assumptions for this? Um, it's been a phase program. So we didn't do all these assessments in year one, on day one, uh, and, then, and then go from there. So some of the assessments have been completed more recently and some were done quite early. Um, and yes, it is possible that the recommendations that were made in the past uh, might need revising, depending on things that have happened. Uh, but if nothing has happened on the road design since the assessment done, then those recommendations are still going to be um, uh, legitimate. So yeah, it depends uh, and it varies quite a bit. But like I said much earlier, for, for the results that get produced out of an IRAP assessment still does require review uh, by expert planners and engineers to make sure that what's coming out of the suggestions is viable uh, and is, is feasible for the local context. And it then needs to be phased into a, into a budget plan. Of course, it can't all be built in, in day one. And if okay. I could add to here, uh, Greg, just, just a small comment. Uh, when we first started this program in 2015, we started, and I think this was a, uh, um, a strategy for each city and each country to start with with pilot programs pilot roads as i showed a bit earlier for bangkok and then build on on the pilot roads build capacity and then go to larger networks and mostly the the network level assessments these were made uh, i think in uh, after 2017 onwards and uh, 18 and 2019 this year also yeah and that i mean that does bring us to the capacity building element of this which has been really really important as well elena Okay. So no more questions. So we can move to capacity building uh, because as I was mentioning, our approach was also to spread knowledge and build capacity around road safety engineering and building knowledge in road safety and road infrastructure safety and the expertise to sustain IRAP assessments in the long term has been a key focus of, of the program. Overall, more than 10,000 people and hopefully the photo is show up because we have a series of photos that we'd like to share with you from different events. Overall, more than 10,000 people from government agencies, partner organizations, institutes, the private sector and non-government organizations have participated in training, workshops and presentations on road safety engineering, road safety data and IRAP since 2015, including the popular online training courses that IRAP introduced at the end of 2018. Since adjustments were made to the IRAP accreditation scheme in 2018, which is a very important milestone, from Africa, for example, 40 practitioners, including from Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Ghana, have obtained 
or are in the process of obtaining IRF accreditation. Yeah, and through this process, we've also engaged lots of local organisation and individuals to lead the actual delivery of the IRF assessment activities. And like, the idea is that through this practical experience, they now de have developed a capability to deliver assessments and training in the future. In fact, more, more than half of the IRAP budget for the program was invested in engaging with these sorts of organisations and people. So the organisations that we worked with it included, for example, LabTrans at the Federal University of Santa Catarina, which is the Brazil RAP Center of Excellence, Chula Longcorn University, which is the um, Thai RAP Center of Excellence, and we were very fortunate to have um, a fantastic launch event for the Thai RAP Center of Excellence last year. The Research Institute of Highways, which is the China RAP Center of Excellence, and we worked also with the University of Transport and Communications in Vietnam, the Institute of Technology in Bandung, and the Institute of Transport and Transport and Engineering in Bandung as well. So each of these organizations and the people that we worked with have the capacity and the capability now to continue to support each of the 10 cities and each of the five countries well into the future. And apart from the direct impact of the activities of the big RS projects in the cities and countries, the capacity building efforts have also helped to really boost a lot of local safety initiatives. So the most notable of these is in China, where the China RAP team has played this central role in the state, state council's Highway Safety to Cherish Life program. So in that program, they implemented engineering safety improvements on about 300,000 kilometers of roads. And those investments were worth about 36 billion yuan in 2016 to 2018. That process, made extensive use of the IRAP methodology and a lot of that was supported through um, engagement in, with the big RS program. The China RAP team as part of that work also drew on, their, on, on our expertise, the IRAP expertise and content to deliver training to more than 4,000 local engineers during that period. So very large scale activities. In Thailand, the Department of Rural Roads has made use of a light methodology um, of the IRAP methodology to assess more than 40,000 kilometers of roads. So they've used road asset data that they already have, combined it with the IRAP methodology to help them really prioritize high risk locations throughout their rural road network. And they've already begun implementing affordable safety countermeasures across their network. And many of those countermeasures are quite innovative. And you can see some examples on the right hand side there, quite in innovative for the rural road context in Thailand. Thank you, Greg. Further on, another important engagement that the team had under the Big RS was related to crash data recording and analysis through the tool called Data for Road Incident Visualization, Evaluation and Reporting, or simple driver. Originally in response to the substantial road safety losses occurring in the Philippines each year and the absence of sound crash data, the World Bank, working with the government of the Philippines, developed and is well underway in the deployment of, of the driver system. Driver is a tool, a web-based is, is a web-based and open source platform for geospatially recording and visualizing road crashes. Driver can link multiple agencies involved in recording road crash data, such as local government units, police and health system. It standardizes terms and definitions for reporting as well as provides analytical tools to support data-driven investments and in policies and monitoring the impact of interventions. Thus, driver can be used to support advocacy for road safety, improve the ownership of the road crash problem by governments uh, by linking relevant agencies and supporting their roles in addressing the problem, as well as to help, as well as help to evaluate early wins and celebrate successes aimed at improving the sustainability of road safety mm -hmm. actions through a public interface that is customizable by the entity responsible for reporting. And on the right hand side, you can see actually the smiley face from a police officer in Philippines who, who moved from collecting crash data on paper to using the driver tool. The key advantages of driver are the following. It is available for free on World Bank's open source code repository uh, and the link is on the screen. 
it can be created and accessed wherever OpenStreetMap is available. Uh, its fields and variables are easy modifiable, and also it can be adapted and maintained by local developers. The World Bank GRSF has been supporting knowledge sharing of driver in a number of countries and cities under Big RS, including the Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, and as well as Bandung, Mumbai, Fortaleza, Sao Paulo, and Accra. In these countries and cities, half-day workshop to educate stakeholders on the opportunities that exist through driver, together with full dedicated support on deployment, have been delivered in the previous two years. Driver scale up in the Philippines is ongoing with over 1,000 police officers trained on recording crash data in, uh, into the system only in the past year. At the same time, pilots are progressing well in Fortaleza, Sao Paulo, and Mumbai with strong support from Big RS partners. One very recent achievement was an MOU signing ceremony just last month between the Bank of Metropolitan Administration, Chilalongkorn University, and the Road Accident Victim Protection Company in, in, in Thailand on the adoption and use of driver, starting with Bangkok. And one of the really interesting things that we've had, or feedback that we've had from the cities in the country is the ability, um, is they would like to see the ability to link the driver crash data with the IRAP data. And that is something that the World Bank in, and IRAP are working on right now. So already in many of our projects, we've used all three sources of data. So crash data from driver, road attribute data collected in the coding, and then the star ratings to help guide the analysis and suggestions about safety countermeasures. The work that we're doing with the bank will help to formalize that and make sure that the connections are available uh, online so that you will in, in the future, when you're using the driver software, uh, be able to zoom in on the location where there's lots of crashes, but then draw on the IRAP data for that location to see what type of attributes are present. For example, is there sidewalks present? Is there pedestrian crossing present? And what are the star ratings? And the interesting analysis that will be available is to compare the star ratings and the crash rates throughout the network. So you'll be able to zoom in on places where for example, there's high numbers of crashes and one star rating. Um, on the other hand, if you find a location that's got a five star rating, so good infrastructure, but still has lots of crashes, it's gonna um, give you the indication that maybe the infrastructure is not the problem. There's some sort of non-infrastructure intervention that could be valuable at that location. Lastly, but uh, also very, very important, we would like to highlight the high toll of traffic injuries on the economy. As a road engineer myself, it is very sad to admit that road transport generates 97% of fatalities from all modes of transport, being the first leading cause of lives lost for young people. And even you have probably heard this before, I still want to highlight the fact that the deaths from road traffic injuries are equivalent to about seven big planes crashing each day. If we had that sort of fatality rate for aviation, would you still fly? But fortunately, we don't have that rate, and unfortunately for us, we are we are more likely we are more likely to be killed driving to the airport than on a flight. At the same time, low and middle income countries suffer 90% of the road crash deaths and injuries, and these deaths and injuries increase poverty and reduce shared prosperity by driving families into economic hardship, and in many cases, poverty when the family's primary income earner is killed or suffers disability. In addition, crash deaths and injuries drain human capital and create costs which have been shown to significantly limit the economic growth of low, middle, low and middle income countries. The cost of this crisis is huge, and the 2017 World Bank report called the high toll of traffic injuries noted that reducing road traffic injuries in half could translate into an additional 7 to 22% of GDP per capita income growth over 24 years. And this would be basically the gray line you can see in the graph on the screen. In other words, this study provides evidence that there is an economic loss associated with every year of inaction where low and middle income countries fail to move beyond, beyond their status quo performance on road safety and instead steer towards a trajectory of substantial reduction in road, in road traffic injuries and deaths. While road traffic injuries constitute two to 5% of all causes of deaths, significant impact on the long-term income growth for the developing countries can be achieved through the reduction in current rate. 
In practice, this means that failing to meet the UN Sustainable Development Goal target to half road deaths by 2020 accrues to about 2 to 3% points in unrealized per capita GDP growth for low and middle income countries. And this is what we call the cost of inaction. There is on the screen a link for the report in case you want to, ha to have access to it. And back to Ali for, for any remaining questions. We have many questions here, but uh, I will invite everyone to continue this conversation on Schoology. Soon I will uh, have a slide to explain how you can access and tomorrow we'll send an email with the instructions, with the access code. So I think we are over time. So if we can move yeah, on. But maybe, yeah, maybe we can take a couple. Ali, since everyone is, is here, I think we're, we are going to run a little over time, but uh, yeah, but, but why don't we take a couple? Um, so, okay, I, uh, there are a few with the same topic, uh, asking about what kind of commitment is needed from decision makers. Uh, okay, I will, I will have a stab at that and then Ali, uh, Alina might jump in as well. Um, the, the leadership from decision makers is so important for road safety. Um, if, if we're able to get a situation where the president or the prime minister says something strong about road safety and particularly commits to targets, that then has an incredibly important flow on effect to the community, to the road agencies and to industry. Um, so working very hard to get that strong leadership engagement is just so important. It's just so key. Um, and some of the, the big arrest partners have been very, very good at that um, and targeting it through strong evidence, uh, including through the IRAP data and the driver data, um, through, for example, awareness campaigns, the development of um, community awareness campaigns about speed or helmet wearing which really, really pulls heartstrings, but helps to engage the community uh, in understanding why road safety is important. Um, but also working at the policy level um, through, for example, the, the WHO, um, understanding the big policy implications of some of these um, approaches in, in taking strong steps on safety. Um, and the work that Alina just talked about, the, the economic impact is really, really important at the national level it really shows the real impact that uh, dealing with road safety has on the economy um, so yeah I, I would say getting leadership and political engagement in safety is just such a critically important uh, step and there's lots lots of learnings from all of the cities and, and the countries I think uh, about what can work and, and what hasn't worked occasionally okay we have one more um, here asking if we have uh, standards, uh, standard measurements on bicycle and walking or walkable lanes in cities and rural areas? Yeah, excellent question. Um, so there's a few places that you can look. So if you, and we're, we're going to have, uh, we'll make sure these links are available, but uh, if you look at the WRI website, um, the, that's the World Road uh, Resources Thank Institute. Uh, yeah, if you if you uh, search on their web page for um, a safe design, safe road design, you're going to find a lot of really valuable information um, about how to design sidewalks. Um, also, the other big RS partner, NACTO, GDCI, so N-A-C-T-O, um, you're going to find their, their international guide uh, for, for designing safe cities. That's really, really valuable as well. So I would start with those two. Uh, and then, yeah, work from there. One more? Okay, Ellie. Yeah, why yeah. not? Um, so there are a few also so be, 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 uh, about behavioral modification. If it, any uh, technique was used uh, for road safety compliance as part of IRAP, IRAP assessment, any behavioral measures Implementing the engineering measures. If I yeah, could, so, uh, yeah, go ahead, Alina. 
yeah just a, a just a brief overview again on the on the program on the bloomberg program um, we mainly focused on the infrastructure, but we had other partners under the Bloomberg Initiative. Uh, we had other partners uh, like John Hopkins University, and they've been doing observational studies on, on different topics like speeding or drink driving. So we basically tried to complement as much as possible uh, our, our work. Over to you, Greg, if you want to add. Yeah, I was just going to say, of course, like the Global Road Safety Partnership did uh, a lot of training on police enforcement and good techniques about enforcement as well. Uh, and the Vital Strategy Team uh, strategy team made a lot of really engaging videos uh, and community um, uh, advertising that reaches huge numbers of people in the community. So it definitely, definitely had all of those elements. And that behavioural element, it really does have this feedback back into the IRAP assessments. Like we saw it very much with the speeds. Uh, we know that um, if, we, if vehicles are actually driving faster than the speed limit, the star, the star ratings are going to reflect that. Um, but similarly, if there's a sidewalk in place, uh, all, the, all the other things being equal, if it's very accessible, that's going to get a good star rating for pedestrians. But if that sidewalk is not used by pedestrians, if the pedestrians have to walk on the road because the sidewalk is used for other purposes, then that road is going to get a poor star rating uh, for pedestrians. So the actual usage of the bit of infrastructure does feed into the I star ratings. And that's something we've talked quite a bit with GRSP about, is the, the interrelationship between behaviour and infrastructure and, and how to optimise the two together. So we might jump into the conclusion then and wrap it up. Yep. Um, I mean, if we have to talk about key takeaways, I think one of my key takeaways from this entire project is that partnerships are key to success. Um, as shown in this webinar, all the success stories are based on working together with other international partners, as, as Greg was also mentioning a bit earlier, like about the GRSP or uh, WRI and NACTO GDCI and uh, John Hopkins University. Um, Stories basically are based on, on working together, but also um, with local and national partners and making sure knowledge, uh, transmit, knowledge is transmitted to them. Of course, we are also very grateful to our donor, Bloomberg Philanthropies, who made all this possible and put together a team from nine international partners with one aim to improve, basically, to improve road safety. Yeah, and I guess the uh, thing for me is that the data to help support evidence based approaches and measures is really, really important. And, and the work that we've had the chance to do in the cities and the countries um, has, has really helped to set up an approach that can be used well into the future. The, uh, the investment plans can be used to help strategically plan investments, not just for one year, but five years and 20 years into the future. They can also be used to help set performance targets. Uh, we might say, okay, across, the, across my city, I wanted it to be four star city for pedestrians uh, by 2025 or 2030. So it forms a basis for starting to project how that could be achieved. And of course, the data like we began with um, is really valuable for doing benchmarks. It really enables the different cities to have some insight about how the infrastructure in their city uh, compares to similar cities around the world. And that example that we talked about earlier about the motorcycle lane facilities is really, really interesting, especially as motorcycle uh, volumes start to increase a lot around the world, not just in developing countries, but we're seeing that start to happen quite a lot in the developed countries in Europe as well, for example. And at the end, uh, I would also like to say that it is very important to share successes as well as lessons learned so that we can all benefit. And this is basically why we had also this, this webinar. All the information presented here is based on reports and studies prepared in each of the 10 cities and five countries in the last five years under the Bloomberg Philanthropies Initiative for Global Road Safety. And I, I'm really sure that maybe some of the examples that we've shown in the last hour perhaps are, are, are very useful in other cities and other countries around the world, which not necessarily were involved in this project, but it's always good to share, to share knowledge, to share experiences. And if you are interested uh, to know more on, on this and on our approach and reports that were produced, 
please don't hesitate to contact us. Yes, as I said before, um, we invite you all to continue this conversation. Uh, we set up a course on Schoology. Uh, this is an online platform. You can uh, register with your student account there. Click on join a course and use this access code. Uh, tomorrow, I will send an email with this information again. So there you'll be able, you have the video, the presentation, and also you can post more questions there. And um, your feedback is very important for us. Uh, so please stay on the line. Uh, there will be a pop-up uh, screen to, with an evaluation form. So please uh, complete with your feedback. And we have more information about this project and more resources for you. Some people ask about IRAP methodology, so you can find and even the studies that we use as the, the reference for our um, methodology. They are on our website. And here you also find in the Bloomberg and in the World Bank more information about this project. And thank you everyone for attending this webinar. Uh, thanks for all your questions. Apologies if we didn't answer all of them, but uh, we will answer on Schoology for you uh, later on. And thanks to our presenters. Do you want to say your final words for today? I can start. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ali. Uh, I'm very grateful to be part of the international road safety family and work with amazing people having a common goal, making roads safer for everyone and saving lives. So very grateful to have the opportunity to work on this project and uh, also to do this webinar. And I hope the results and, and the case studies that we shared with, with the audience are, are useful for everyone. And thank you so much. That's it from my side. Thanks. Yeah, and I'd just like to say a big thank you also, firstly, to all the cities and the countries that we had the opportunity to work with and to welcome us um, into, into their systems um, and embrace what we're doing and, and be very open-minded about sometimes trying something new. So we very much appreciate that. Uh, thank you also, of course, to um, the World Bank and Bloomberg Philanthropies and the Big RS partners. And of course, all of you for joining the webinar. I very much appreciate you taking the time uh, to join. For, for me, road safety is the number one issue to be dealt with, not just in transport, but for public health, particularly for young people. Um, so your commitment to join this webinar and, and take part um, is very much appreciated. So thank you very much. Bye, thank you. Bye.